welcome everybody to the Center for Christian Jewish Learning's ninth annual John Paul II Lecture in Christian Jewish Relations. I am Ruth Langer, for those of you who I don't know. I am the interim director of the Center and professor of Jewish studies in our theology department here at Boston College. And together with Camille Markey, who's standing in the back with handouts, if anyone didn't get one, please wave at her. Uh, I run, we run the Center for this current configuration. We are hoping that our Corcoran Chair Professor will be able to join us in the United States in the near future. There's progress on a visa. Um, it's a great pleasure to be welcoming you to our first in-person event since the pandemic began also. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we miss our live but virtual uh, national and international audiences. And uh, this lecture is being recorded and will be shared with them. And hopefully future events will be able to live stream uh, on Zoom also uh, so that they are able to be in, to join us in real time still. Uh, the recorded event will be available on our website and through our YouTube channel uh, once it has been processed. So please, if you're excited about this lecture, let your friends know about it uh, because they will have access to it. Now, it's a real privilege to welcome back to Boston College, back to Boston, and also back to Boston College, Professor Paula Fredrickson, who, as most of you know, is a leading voice in the study of early Christianity, particularly within its Jewish and Greco-Roman contexts. She holds degrees from Wellesley College, Oxford University, and her PhD from Princeton University. In 1990, she returned to Boston and served as the Aurelio Professor of Scripture at Boston University for 20 years before retiring and becoming the Distinguished Visiting Professor of Comparative Religion at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Reviewing Fredrickson's publications would require a lecture on its own, but two of, these, two of her most recent books are, hold it right side up, are available for, public, for purchase at a discount in the back of the room, so after the lecture, feel free to do what I did and buy your own copies. Um, I should just say, though, that she has made a major contributions to the understanding of the historical Jesus, to the transformation of the historical Jesus into the Christ of Christianity, to understanding Paul in his Jewish context and his reception and impact on Christianity, including as interpreted by Augustine, and she's written also on Augustine himself. Much of her writing is alert to the implications of these understandings for subsequent Christian Jewish relations, and she has been an influential voice in our current thinking about how such historical insights may and should influence contemporary interreligious relations. It's therefore quite appropriate that we welcome Paula Fredrickson to deliver this year's John Paul II lecture, named in memory of the Pope who did so much towards implementing Nostra Aetate's rethinking of Christian traditions of anti-Judaism. She will be speaking today about interreligious relations in the world into which Christianity emerged. We look forward to hearing from you, Paula, about Messy monotheism, the crowded cosmos of ancient Jews and Christians. Please welcome Paula Fredrickson. Um, it is with permission that I'm taking off my mask. Here's the rest of my face. Um, this is the first time I've been, uh, I've given a lecture in real time since February of 2020, so it's um, a little bit disconcerting to be looking at human beings instead of my monitor, but I'll, I'll do the best I can. Everybody have a handout because I'll be referring to it and I'll tell you when to look at it. Um, and I don't have my reading glasses on, so. No, that doesn't help that much, okay. Here we go. This afternoon, I'm here to speak about someone 
who really needs no introduction, God. Without any further context, whether you have a denominational affiliation or none, without indeed my even having to say anything else, you all already know who I'm talking about. That God needs no introduction is for two main cultural reasons. I'm speaking uh, historically here in terms of the West. The first reason God needs no introduction is because he is the main narrative character within a collection of books that has had a profound and formative effect on Western culture. Yes, I'm talking about the Bible. The second reason why God needs no introduction is that we all stand in this culture and share it. It's the water we swim in. For this reason also, I did not need to explain my title, monotheism, the belief that there is a single and singular God. Sacred scripture, both for Jews and for Christians, are texts bequeathed to us from the ancient past. We share these books with our cultural ancestors, but we do not share our culture with our cultural ancestors. They lived in a world very different from our own, not only technologically or linguistically or sociologically, but theologically as well. No chasm yawned for them between what we think of as science and what we think of as religion. In fact, the two systems were expressions of each other. I want to bring you into their world so that we can explore together the ways that they dealt with the divine. To do this, we have to rearrange our mental map of the universe, which brings us to our first topic, cosmic architecture. The timeline on the handout is just so you can have a sense of the uh, cast of characters I'll be referring to, but we're starting with cosmic architecture. A crucial point of orientation is the location of the Earth. Their Earth was at the center of the universe where the heaviest matter had sunk. Closest to Earth orbited the moon, which demarcated a kind of lunar borderlands between heavy, earthy air and the upper air of the heavens. Further up into the universe, the better the universe got. More beautiful, more stable, immortal, luminous. Above and outside the moon circled six more spheres, the five planets known to antiquity, and the sun. And then beyond them, think of, of nested glass balls, if that helps you imagine this universe. Beyond them, the outer, outermost edge was described by the zodiac, and that was the realm of the fixed stars. Stars and planets were made of special, immortal, luminous matter called penuma. That word is translated as spirit, and because of the accidents of the Platonists winning that argument, we tend to think of spirit as something that's immaterial. But penuma for ancient science is something that's very, very fine matter, and it, it, it glows in the dark. That's why stars and planets and angels and other, other entities with uh, pneumatic bodies are, are as beautiful as they are. Stars and planets also embodied intelligences. They had personality, they had gender, they had social agency, and they had real effects on human life on Earth. These beings were referred to as theoi, gods. The names they still answer to, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, that comes from somewhere. But these visible deities were not alone. The cosmos was filled with superhuman, non-human, and post-human divine beings. High gods, lesser gods, formerly human gods, human gods, if you were the Roman emperor, spirits, daimonia, which means, it doesn't mean, it sounds like it should mean demon, but it means godlings, sort of little gods. Um, angeloi, angels, divine messengers, and so on. In other words, this world hummed with interspecies communications. 
gods really did constitute a world wide web, thick with social media, and their social media through which they communicated to us below was the wind, the weather, earthquake, floods, pandemics, animal viscera, the, the flight of birds, and so on. All of these things were means of divine human communication. The first point to bear in mind here is that the word theos, or in Latin, deus, God, was very elastic in antiquity. It could refer to a huge range of beings. Ancient intellectuals, like their modern counterparts, liked clarity, and they would sometimes try to organize these powers by ranking them, uh, the highest god, and then high gods, and then not so high gods, and so on, just plain gods. Most people, however, were content to relate to gods on a case-by-case -case basis. The second point to remember is that ancient divinity was primarily a register of power. Any god is more powerful than any human. A third point to bear in mind is that most normal gods were, in, I put aside philosophical gods who are the gods of a tiny, tiny minority and had their own issues, but normal gods. Most normal gods were invested in human behavior. Mediterranean gods, much like Mediterranean humans, enjoyed public demonstrations of respect. Such enactments of respect, which we might think of with the word piety, put gods in a good mood. And this was important because an angry god could wreak all sorts of havoc earthquakes, war, motivated catastrophe. Ancient cities had each had its own presiding god or gods, and the citizens of a city spent a lot of their time making sure that the city kept its celestial guardians in a good mood. Sacrifices, processions, sacred days, and dedicated competitions, like the Olympics, all of these went into the effort to please the gods. I introduce a fourth point now, but I'll ask you to bear this in mind as I continue. Most Mediterranean gods, as far as I can figure out, had sexual relations both with each other and with humans. And Zeus and Heracles were particularly active in this area. These sexual unions could give rise to special rulers like Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar, or they could produce entire people groups. The Spartans, for example, were descended from Heracles, which is a point I'll go back to later on. Finally, particular people groups lived in particular places. Gods attached to these places locally just as genealogically they attached to specific peoples. Ancient theology, in other words, was a species of ancient anthropology and vice versa. Or as I've stated the same idea elsewhere, in antiquity, gods ran in the blood. People groups considered themselves to be related to each other by blood, genealogically, and obviously to um, the dead, another generation of the family. But they were also related genealogically to their gods. And here comes a, another Greek word, sungenia, which is uh, under human architecture. It means kinship, sun with, and that, like our word gene, sungenia, kinship. This concept, like the idea of God itself, also stretched vertically between heaven and earth. Peoples were related to each other in the same ethnic or people group, and people formed kinship groups with their gods. This is why antiquity had no word or concept that corresponds exactly with our word religion. Gods and humans related through the human enactment of ancestral custom or the practices of the fathers, or the patriarchal traditions. You can hear the idea of inheriting these things from ancestors 
uh, just called tapatria, the, the dad stuff. Um, is one description of what these religious protocols were about. These protocols often were revealed by the god, him or herself, and they spelled out the ways that their humans could please them and stay on their good side. The word that is translated as faith in your Bible, in antiquity means something more like faithfulness or loyalty to, loyalty to the god, which was demonstrated by pious attention to inherited etiquette. An initiative had its rewards. Happy gods made for happy humans, and nobody wanted to deal with an angry god. What was the architecture of humanity if this is the cosmos that humans fit into? These pious practices were all similar between different people groups but they described and defined what ancient people thought of as what we call ethnicity. People were defined by their blood group and they were defined by their homeland. They were also defined by their native language. These ideas are more or less ubiquitous when we look at ancient writings of anthropology or geography. But I'll point to you to three specific examples. Um, which is in item number two of human architecture, the first cluster of texts. In Genesis 10, after the flood, humanity is restored through the progeny of Noah's three sons. God divides the human world up into 70 people groups. This is the first occurrence of the word goyim in the Hebrew Bible, peoples. And he, God divides peoples up, quote, according to their lands, with their languages, by their families, and in their nations, end quote. Later, when Moses is referring to this episode in Deuteronomy 32.8, he adds one more qualifier, according to the number of the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God, who are also themselves gods. Land, language, kinship, gods. That's how you identified an ancient ethnic group. In the minus fifth century, Herodotus described Greekness with similar categories, land, language, shared blood, sacred traditions, and altars. The apostle Paul in the mid first century, plus first century, Romans nine, three to five, describes his brothers and kinsmen according to the flesh, the Israelites, with many of these same categories as well. They are his blood brother, brothers. These are the Israelites. They have been given, and this is the tapatria, uh, covenants, promises, the law, the divine presence, which is translated as glory uh, in your English uh, New Testaments, the sacrificial cult, which is translated as worship in your English. The word litreia actually means sacrifice. And uh, they've been given the Messiah. Note also that Paul calls Israel's, Israel God's sons. But he's very careful about how he phrases it. He uses a word that means adoption. Unlike Greek gods, the Jewish God adopted his human family. He did not generate it with another human being. Thus, the Jewish God was something of a Mediterranean outlier. Like his other Mediterranean colleagues, Israel's God was a father to a particular people, associated with a particular place, and with particular cultic traditions. But unlike other gods, Israel's God took no human sexual partners. He was Israel's father by choice. His paternity was not biological, but affective through feeling, and covenantal through mutual agreements. God had chosen Israel, according to Deuteronomy, because he loved them. They sealed their relationship with mutual agreements. That's what covenants are. Sometimes these were conceptualized as metaphors for marriage with, is, with power gendered the way you would expect. God's teaching, his Torah, or in Greek nomos, the law, specified those behaviors by which Israel was to enact their love, loyalty, and faithfulness to him. Those of you who know the Shema 
know what I'm referring to. According to biblical narrative, God did this because he wanted to. For reasons he never really explains, God chose to set this particular people apart from other peoples to be for himself. Other nations could have their gods. Israel would have only Israel's God. And Israel could not worship Israel's God by using images. Please note, salvation, however you define it, was neither the motive nor the goal of ancestral practices. The purpose of Israelite inherited customs, but also for other ethnic groups inherited customs, was to please the God, in Israel's case, to please Israel's God, quoting Deuteronomy 11.9 here, so that you might live long in the land. Abiding by ancestral custom secured safety and well-being, which is the first definition of the terms that gets translated soteria or solace. Gets, it's translated as salvation, but it means security. In other words, Jewish practices were about how one lived one's current life, not about what might happen or would happen in some future life. Salvation as a happy post-mortem afterlife was a very specialized concern and the particular expertise of philosophy and of members of mystery cults. The pious observance of tapatria, inherited custom, was a daily concern. It was part of the business of daily living. To condense this observation, and speaking specifically now about Israel, Jewish law was not primarily focused on post-mortem afterlives, thus on this cosmic idea of salvation. And Jewish law was by definition the concern of Jews. Let's pivot then from life on earth back to life between heaven and earth. How did all these gods and all these different people get along? Better than we're doing now, I think. Platonic philosophers were ancient monotheists. They held to the idea that there was one highest God who stood above all the busyness of the congested cosmic realm, but they also continued to worship the lower gods, even though they thought in terms of a single highest God above them. But we all, those are the philosophers. How many people was that in antiquity? Not a lot of people. We also have popular pagan expressions of, quote, monotheism. Inscriptions that give a shout out to the people's local god. And the shout out is usually in Greek, but I'll say it in English. One god in heaven. Such expressions attest to local patriotism, not to the absolute number of the divine population. Jews, translating their Hebrew texts into Greek, will use the same designation, highest god, theos hypsustos, for their own god. But as we see with pagan groups, it's a comparative category of the class gods, the highest god among other gods. And this is what we find in Jewish scriptures. I'm now at the bottom of the first page. God was not the only God, even in his own book. Your handout gives a quick sampling of biblical verses that name other lower gods. In situations of war, they battle with Israel's God, but Israel's God wins. These beings have conversations with God. They populate God's heavenly court. They bow down to him. They serve as the gods of other peoples. Eventually, in the late Second Temple period, Jews will generate myths domesticating these other superhuman powers as errant angels or as not very smart political subordinates. In the biblical narrative, however, often these gods just show up. So what about Jewish monotheism, the belief that there is only one God? Scholars of Hebrew Bible often locate the birth of this idea in the period after the Babylonian exile. But the data are messy. 
and they do not really conform to our modern idea of monotheism. Scholars respond by generating categories. That's what we do. It's part of what we get paid for. We have henotheism, the belief in one highest god among other gods. We have monolatry, the worship of only one god. Or, and here's my personal favorite, we have megatheism, which means my god is bigger than your god. I propose for the rest of our time together to look at the evidence from the Greek diaspora and how different Jews coped with all these different gods and how they coped with them specifically in Greek. The gods of the Hebrew scriptures in Hebrew were often the neighboring competition, local Canaanite or Philistine deities. But once Alexander the Great, the second item, the third item on your uh, timeline, once Alexander the Great in the minus 300s took Greek culture east. And once Jewish populations shifted west, Jewish sacred writings shifted into Greek as well. The pagan gods received a Hellenistic upgrade. Greek gods stood at the core of high Greek culture. Bless you. Again, these gods staffed the celestial department of homeland security for their Greco-Roman cities. Gods crammed the curricula of the educated. Anyone with a decent Greek education would spend years memorizing, analyzing, and imitating Homer. Living in a Greco-Roman city meant living with Greco-Roman neighbors, both human and divine. Practical relationships had to be established and etiquette pre preserved, and that is exactly what our sources show us. Please remember the idea of divine human kinship, sungenia, family relations between gods and humans. These connections were conceptualized so realistically that they served as the building blocks of translocal diplomacy and politics. Diplomats would work to establish treaties between cities or kingdoms by generating genealogies to the negotiating parties back to a common shared divine ancestor. This is known in the business as kinship diplomacy. Now, please recall the birth of Hanukkah under the Maccabean revolt against Antiochus IV. Uh, and the rebellion was in part because of the introduction of Greek protocols and ritual in the Jerusalem temple. The Hasmoneans won the day. No to Greek assimilation. But Hasmonean Jerusalem sought an alliance with Sparta. But the Jewish god didn't have a human family. So how could Sparta and Jerusalem have kinship diplomacy? What to do? Jewish diplomats mobilized the granddaughter of Abraham. And if you go to page two, this is under practical relations with other gods. Jewish diplomats mobilized a granddaughter of Abraham's who dated Hercules with the predictable result. Quote, after reading a certain document, announces a Spartan king to the Jewish high priest, we, we have found that Judeans and Spartans are of one genos, one people, and we share a connection with Abraham. As you see from our handout, the alliance is alluded to in the books of the Maccabees, as well as in Josephus. Through kinship diplomacy, sometime after 160 BCE, Heracles had acquired a Jewish girlfriend. We, we see this taken for granted interaction with non-Jewish gods in levels less glamorous than intercity diplomacy. Sometime in the minus third century, for example, two local gods of health, Ampharos and Hygienia, communicated a command through a dream to Moscus, son of Moscion. You have all this information uh, on the handout. Moscus was told to put an inscription up in their temple, and luckily for people like me, he did. And he identified himself as Moscus, 
Eudaios. Wealthy Jews, like Nikitas of Jerusalem or like Herod the Great, sponsored athletic competitions that were dedicated to Greek gods. One glycon, you have his inscription there too, also a Jew, arranged for distributions from an endowment he established to be made on Passover, Shavuot, and January 1st, the Roman New Year. Two Jewish teenagers in Cyrene have their names listed on an inscriptional plaque dedicated to the gymnasium's two gods, Heracles, Braun, and Hermes, Brain. One extraordinary synagogue inscription witnesses to a slave's manumission by invoking the God of Israel at its opening and closing by summoning the witnesses of Zeus, Gaia, and Helios. You have the text in front of you, I won't read it. Jews served in foreign armies. They sat on town councils. They were members of the school board. They worked as athletes, actors, and gladiators. They served as spectators or as participants in civic, athletic, and cultural competitions. All of these cultural activities were dedicated to the presiding gods. Finally, in the gymnasia and the stadia, I say this because many of my Christian students, because of a sentence in the Acts of the Apostles, think that all Jews thought all Gentiles were impure and wouldn't go near them. In fact, they're traveling in the same subways all the time. In the gymnasia, in the stadia, and in the public baths, unclothed Jews mixed and mingled with equally unclothed pagans in the presence of the images of Greek gods. As we know from a passage in Mishnah of Odazara, Rabban Gamaliel felt that he had some explaining to do when he went to a bath that had a beautiful statue of Aphrodite. In this same period, we have evidence for pagans in Jewish places. Pagans bankrolled synagogue buildings. They got touched up for fundraisers. They refurbished mosaics. They had access to the largest court in the precincts of Herod's magnificent temple complex. My point is simple. Roman period Jews did not live in a bell jar. They lived in the same geocentric universe with the same God-congested culture as everyone else did. This fact should compl complicate our ideas about ancient Jewish monotheism. I'd like to use our remaining time together by turning to the writings of two first century Greek speaking diaspora Jews, Philo of Alexandria and the Apostle Paul. I do so first of all because I can. We have their writings. Their respective social locations, of course, were wildly, wildly different. Philo was a wealthy aristocratic philosopher, highly educated intellectual, and a sometime diplomat. Paul was a wandering, charismatic teacher, a member of a messianic movement, a prophet, and a wonder worker. This is his self-description from his letters. Proclaiming to ex-pagan Gentiles the impending and Jewishly conceived end of history with the coming of the Messiah and the resurrection of the dead. As part of their working day, however, both Philo and Paul had to take account of all these other gods. And Paul in particular, I will argue, depended upon these gods to define Jesus as the Davidic Messiah, Jesus the Christ. But first, let's look at Philo. Throughout his writings, Philo routinely speaks the standard tropes of Jewish anti-pagan rhetoric. He repudiates the gods of the nations as dumb images and as uh, lifeless statues. But commenting on Exodus 22:28 in the Greek, he endorses the sacred text's injunction not to revile the gods. The Hebrew Elohim, which had referred to the God of Israel, in Greek became the plural, the gods. Why not revile pagan gods? Because, Philo observed, 
Reviling other people's gods always leads to war. Was Philo just having good manners? Was this social prudence? Was it theological courtesy? Philo's sacred scripture in its Greek voice didn't say. It only said that Moses thought that the gods of the nations should be treated with some degree of respect. The translators of Exodus 22 had made themselves, had made room for these other gods, Theoi, but the translator of Psalms took a different tack. The Hebrew of Psalm 96 denounced the gods of the nations as idols, but in Psalm 95, 5 in the Septuagint, the gods of the nations are daimonia. They're not tchotchkes anymore. It's not statue, it's a lower god. This is a distinction with a difference. An idol is a material representation, but a daimonion is the divine power itself. Any human can destroy an idol. No human can destroy a god. This translation and transition from the Hebrew idols to the Greek godlings did double duty, at once elevating and demoting the Greek gods. The vocabulary granting that they were more than mere statue, statuary also called them godlings. They were just little gods compared to the God of Israel. Philo the Middle Platonist also reflects this idea of real though subordinate multiple divinities in his commentary on Genesis. Reviewing the days of creation, Philo observes that when he, established, when he God established the firmament, God created, quote, the most holy dwelling place of the manifest and visible gods. He's talking about the stars and planets. Philo, who represents first century Alexandrian modern orthodoxy, is calling stars and planets gods. So elastic was the idea of divinity, so easily admitting of degrees, so variously applicable, that Philo can comfortably speak of God's logos, which means word or reason. The logos is God's lieutenant in the work of material creation. Philo refers to him as an angel, as God's firstborn son, as a second God, deuteros theos, a second God. And even more remarkably, he attributes this quality as well to a human figure, Moses. On account of Moses' moral and spiritual excellence, Moses was named God and King, and he's there very close to the Hebrew, um, of the whole nation. How can the same superhuman agent in creation be at once the divine logos, the divine son, an angel, and another God? Such a claim caused no problem for Philo, nor, about a century later, would it agitate Justin Martyr, a, a Christian theologian from the year 150? Justin refers to Christ with these same four terms. But how can a human be a god? Variously, but there they are, across Mediterranean populations, even the monotheist ones. Moses was theos for Philo. Two centuries later, in his commentary on Paul's letter to the Romans, the great Christian theologian Origen will name David and Paul gods. You have that in your handout. The emperor, both before Constantine and after, was conceived of and treated as a divine figure. Pagans distinguished between gods who had always been immortal and gods who were currently immortal. Deities in the later category had begun life as humans, and this could have tax consequences. The Roman Senate ruled that Ampharos, the local holdings of this health god that, who we bumped into four and a half centuries earlier in, in Moscos' inscription, um, because Ampharos had begun life as a human, his uh, local temple could be taxed. But it is Paul, Philo's contemporary, who speaks most emphatically about the social agency, the presence, the power, and the cosmic and therefore religious significance of pagan gods. As he traveled the Eastern Mediterranean, speaking his good news of the coming kingdom, 
Paul had to deal with these gods at close quarters. After all, he was traveling in their neighborhoods. For example, corresponding with his Gentile community in Corinth, he complained that, quote, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. You have the text in front of you. Modern commentators will insist that by God in this sentence, Paul must mean the devil, that is, Satan. But that's not what Paul says. He's perfectly capable of naming Satan when he wants to, and he does so in seven other passages in his other letters. Paul's frequent recourse to Satan, in fact, makes Paul's use of the word God in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, that much more striking because it's obviously deliberate. What particular God did Paul have in mind? He doesn't tell us. Elsewhere, Paul simultaneously sounds, again, the biblical tropes of denial and defiance when speaking of pagan gods. In 1 Corinthians 8, instructing his ex-pagan Gentile assembly, he says, and I'm reading from him now, we know that an idol has no being in the world and that there is no God but one, because even if there are so-called gods, either in heaven or on earth, here comes the money quote, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, and one Lord, which is another divinity designation, uh, Jesus Christ. Verse 6 does not deny the truth of verse 5, which plainly acknowledges the theological congestion of the first century cosmos. Rather, it situates Paul's listeners within their newly Judaized cosmos. The existence of all these many other gods and deities notwithstanding, says Paul, Paul's people are to adhere solely to Paul's God, the God of Israel, and able to do so because they have within them the pneuma, the spirit of that God's son, Christ. Who are these many gods and lords? Again, we look first to the stars and planets encircling the earth. In his letter to Rome, Paul names hostile heavenly intermediaries, angeloi. He names principalities, arche, and he names dunamis, powers. These are all words corresponding to cosmic spheres of influence. Communicating with his assembly in Philippi, he invokes a divine plenum of celestial, terrestrial, and subterranean deities. A lot of non-human knees will bend when the Messiah comes back. He says, Paul says, the cosmic elements, stoichia, are not themselves gods by nature, even though they had previously enslaved Paul's pagan, ex-pagan communities. And as we have seen, the god of this age, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, often got in Paul's way. Cosmic forces had been benevolent for Philo. Stars and planets were God's creatures, God's lower gods who providentially guided human travelers on their way. These same beings were malevolent for Paul. Why? Because, unlike Philo, Paul was part of a messianic movement that was expecting the kingdom of God to be established imminently. In the brief moment between Christ's resurrection and his triumphant public manifestation, he was manifested within his communities who had pneumatic powers. This is what enabled pagans to make an exclusive commitment, said Paul, to the God of Israel. Indeed, said Paul, if Gentiles are voluntarily repudiating their own gods and turning to the God of Israel, that's another proof that the kingdom is at hand. But how did their gods feel about this? Temperamental at the best of times, gods were quick to take offense and offended gods acted out. I'll just mention pandemics and then go on. In other words, Greco-Roman cities represented intricate religious ecosystems that were kept in dynamic equilibrium through human attention to religious protocols for showing respect. The phenomenon of pagan God-fearing, 
pagans who, as pagans, were in some way or other affiliated with Jewish synagogue communities, was a typical Mediterranean both and model for dealing with divine diversity that enabled Jewish diaspora communities to settle comfortably within these religious ecosystems. Synagogues welcomed interested outsiders, and why not? Absent apocalyptic aspirations, the paganism of majority culture was entirely normal. The nations, of course, had their own gods. Israel had Israel's God. The gospel message disrupted this careful balance of relations between heaven and earth. Little wonder then that Paul experienced so much pushback. From anxious synagogue authorities, he says that he was uh, received 39 lashes five times. From angry urban mobs, from Roman magistrates attempting to keep, uh, keep the peace, and as you've just seen from our handout, pushback from the gods themselves. But he and his Gentile assemblies continued to defy their opposition, whether human or divine, which, remember rule number one of the road, any god is more powerful than any human. How did these, where did these people's self-confidence come from? Paul and his people were bound together literally and materially by a stronger power, the pneuma of the son of Israel's god. Paul's phrasing sometimes implies that the risen Christ was a visible object, but most often he uses the language of location. Christ or Christ's pneuma, spirit, is in Paul or in the body of the believer or in the church at large. When God revealed his son to Paul, he doesn't reveal him to Paul. In the Greek, he reveals him in Paul. Christ's indwelling spirit manifests by enabling his followers to do charismatic acts. Ex-pagan Gentiles can do works of power. They can divine the meanings of scriptures. They can prophecy. They can speak the speech of angels. They can do exorcisms and healings. In effect, this sharing of spirit bound the entire church, ecclesia, assembly, into one body, specifically the body of Christ. Messiah was a term that also could admit of many meanings. Its application to the figure of Jesus testifies to that semantic versatility. But for Paul, Christ's function as a Davidic Messiah is surprisingly traditional. Manifesting through Pneuma in the first century here and now to the elect few, Jesus' status as God's son, the royal Davidic warrior, would be manifest in power globally when he raises the dead and transforms the living. Humanity will change from bodies of flesh and blood, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, into bodies of pneuma. The flesh will change into spirit. But to do that, to accomplish this transformation, Christ had to get past the pagans' gods. Paul. In other words, like many other first century Jewish apop apocalyptic visionaries, foresees a final battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. In 1 Corinthians 15, Christ destroys or abolishes these cosmic forces. In 1 Thessalonians, Christ descends from heaven, quote, with a cry of command in the archangel's call and the sound of the trumpet of God. Military imagery. In Philippians 2, Paul's exalted Christ returns and subjugates these gods, all those non-human knees above, below, and uh, upon the earth are bending. Remember Psalm 97.7, all the gods bow down to him. In short, redemption for Paul is preceded by a cosmic battle of the gods. The pacification of the pagan cosmos will occur once the Redeemer manifests from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem to gather in the fullness of the nations. This is Romans 11, 25 through 26, and it's the final line of the second page of our handout. The Redeemer will gather in the fullness of the nations and all Israel. The fullness of the nations, 
is 70 nations. All Israel for a Davidic Messiah is 12 tribes. Transformed into bodies of Pneuma, Paul proclaims, the redeemed will enter their celestial commonwealth, ascending to God's kingdom in heaven, which means in the realm above the moon. That's where Pneuma belongs. It was through his impending defeat of these other gods that biblically sanctioned royal lineage and Davidic military valor come together to define Jesus as the Messiah. I have to sum up, and I can, and I will. As we have seen from our brief review of Philo and Paul, and from our sideways glance at some Jewish inscriptions, native Jews, too, were well aware of the gods of the nations. The stars in Philo's firmament are divinities. They are created as gods by his God. Jews in the lands of these gods, among the peoples of these gods, found ways to show respect while continuing in their own ancestral customs. And besides skirmishing with offended lower deities in the course of his own mission, Paul depends upon these lower gods to shape his vision of the end time. Pagan gods define Jesus' role as Davidic Messiah. No opposition, no final battle. No final battle, no Davidic Messiah. Paul's messianism is, of course, Jewish. But that Jewish messianism sits within a, a broader defining native first century context, Greco-Roman paganism. What set Jews apart from their pagan contemporaries was their behaviors, not their beliefs. And we get pagans commenting on this sort of thing all the time. Jews are weird. They don't eat pork. Um, they take off one day out of every seven. They circumcise their sons. They also circumcised ex-pagans who want to become Jews. Jews generally seemed disinclined or were thought to be disinclined to sacrifice to foreign gods, even if that god were the emperor. And this Jewish disinclination was respected by pagan culture for the most part. Caligula is always an exception to the rule. Because these were customs that were grounded in ancestral practice. An ancestral custom was the hallmark in antiquity of respectable religion. But Jews, whether begotten or made, were clearly present at pagan cult. They filled the theaters, the council chambers, the gymnasia, and the schools of Mediterranean cities. They availed themselves of public baths and of mixed professional guilds, which met and had a meet and greet kind of dinner together um, when they got together. They served as soldiers, as actors, and as athletes. They managed, doubtless in different ways, to do what they thought they could do or should do to attenuate cultic participation. Though, as our inscriptions tell us, they also directed attention to various lower divinities as circumstance required. Jews, in principle, avoided active participation in public cult acts but Jews did mix with pagans, both human and divine. This brings me to my concluding point, the usefulness of the term monotheism. Our scholarly reliance on monotheism as a term of historical description occludes these vibrant and vital aspects of ancient Mediterranean religiousness. The term itself was invented in the 1660s, once modern science had drastically rearranged and somewhat decongested the universe. By that point, as historian David Brackey has observed, and I'm quoting David here now, quote, entire classes of lower gods and goddesses had either disappeared or suffered demotion while new faces, human saints, joined the celestial regions, the once bustling community of diverse daimones settled into a stable two-party system of angels and demons. 
I won't speculate on which side is blue and which side is red. Applied to antiquity, the word monotheism distorts much more than it clarifies. It invites anachronism. It violates ancient conceptualizations of divinity, conceptualizations that our ancient texts say differently about. And the word monotheism leaves us unprepared, perhaps even unable, to see what stands before us and our ancient evidence. All the many other gods who look out at us from the stones of the Eastern Empire, from the songs of the ancient psalmist, from Philo's learned commentaries, and from the urgent letters of the Apostle Paul. Thank you very much. I can, if there are, I can confuse you more if you have a question. <laughs> yes, please. Um, thanks so much for your wonderful talk. Oh, sorry. I'm project well enough without. Um, I was just wondering, you um, contrasted Paul and Philo, and you mentioned Paul being part of this um, apocalyptic um, and eschatological tradition. I'm wondering how some of the separatist movements, say like the Qumran community, for example, would have would fit in that paradigm and how they would react to say you know the, this cosmic universe um, or these nestled bowls of, of different gods. You, the Qumran community was also one of those groups that imagined a cosmic battle between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. I mean, there's a that contest, and they're they're talking about not just humans fighting, but angels as well, which is why they had very strict uh, puri purity. Um, regulations as well. It's a very, um, I don't know if Paul spoke Aramaic, but I, I, if he wandered into Qumran, I could see him having an agreeable conversation at dinner um, with some of the Dead Sea Scroll folks. I mean, they're envisioning the wrap up of history and the solution to the problem of evil in similar ways. Thanks. Thank you for your question. That was a bombshell talk. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I am dazzled by all of the implications it has for the pericopes we take for granted as having a certain identity. Um, I have two questions. One, how soon will you be publishing this? And two, how are powerful interests reacting to it? What a fun couple of questions. <laughs> um, some of this stuff um, is available in uh, the books that are in the back of the room. Um, I'm negotiating movie rights momentarily with both, of, especially the one on Paul. So there's that. And the Marvel comic book series is going to be picking up a lot of this. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm, the article that this uh, is a version of will be coming out in Harvard Theological Review in January of 2020. This is 2021, right? I keep yeah. forgetting. So, okay, 2022. Um, when I was advocating, uh, I'm part of a group of scholars who get together and present papers at panels at conferences. It's called Paul Within Judaism that situates Paul within first century Judaism. Well, that was entirely too easy. We persuaded absolutely everybody. And now that I'm presenting Judaism within paganism, I'm offending just about everybody else. So that's how it's going. Thank you for asking. A couple, a couple of questions. One, I think, if you would explain, I know what you've written about it, but why you use the term pagans and, and sort of how that fits in. And maybe also you just referred to the problem of evil. And is everybody as worried about the problem of evil as maybe Paul and the Essenes are? Um, I'll answer the last question first because that's the one I remember the best. <laughs> no, apocalyptic groups are the ones that have this very kinetic idea of resolution uh, to the problem of evil. 
um, paganism isn't uh, a problem for most people most of the time. It's just how the world is. The, the, uh, the knowledge that stands behind um, Professor Perkins' question is that the word pagan is a fourth century term of uh, derogation, trash talk, that Christians make up to distinguish Gentiles who are Christians from Gentiles who are not Christians. It's a word that comes out of the fourth century. The reason I used it is because in an oral presentation, everybody knows who I'm talking about. Um, so it was shorthand. But um, it violates my own principles because one of the reasons I can't stand the use of the term monotheism is that it's, it ignores all the, all, the, all the stuff that's going on, both on a normal basis and uh, in an apocalyptic battle. Um, as well. I think people are ready for carrot sticks and conversation. Is, is that true? Oh, one more question. Hi. <clears throat> this is an amateur question uh, for an expert, but there is this strong strain in the Hebrew Bible of insisting on those one God. Mm -hmm. I think of it with Deuteronomy, but it's other places. So was there a struggle? Was there an intellectual struggle for doing different camps within um, the Jewish tradition, within the pagan world? Were they fighting about this? Or was it kind of an easy... Were, were live Jews live? fighting about stuff? I, I can't imagine. Um, um, it depends on what verse you look at in the Bible, right? Sometimes it says God, sometimes, and there are also plenty of pagan inscriptions that say one God. And when they know perfectly well there's more than one God because they are, are giving a shout out for Artemis, but they're still going to the Olympics, which are in honor of it, right? So it's, there's, um, the issue is how we intellectually hear the term monotheism that I think distorts what, what you have to think. They didn't have modern science. If they had, let's say, a pandemic, they had to explain. They didn't have viruses to explain it. They had angry gods, and that worked as a cover theory, too. I'm not advocating that as an explanation now, but I'm saying it's, it's not an, an accident that it's in the 1660s that the idea of one lonely god alone, so it's all good, it happens to everybody, um, that, that there is only one single solitary God. And that, that takes a lot of repositioning of the universe to, to have that idea be born. Thank you for your question. Right, thank you for that talk. Um, I have two questions that are related. So um, just thinking about like Paul's uh, the churches that he founded, especially in light of, uh, you know, ancient ethnicity, Paul kind of encourages Gentiles to adopt, you know, the Jewish God to adopt. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't Paul, quite hear you. Paul he, encourages Gentiles to. He encourages Gentiles to adopt many, uh, many practices that uh, Jewish people, you know, engaged in. Right. So in many ways, like from a social perspective, they might be kind of like performative Jews, but Paul does not want Gentiles to fully convert by becoming circumcised, things like that to be, he doesn't want them to become Jews. For sure. So right. I guess I'm, the question is, what kind of group would you understand these ancient churches to be? Would you understand them to be Jew, quote unquote Jewish groups? And I guess related to that, you often make the, you, I heard you a couple of times say that uh, these uh, pagans were like, I guess, uh, ex-Gentiles or something no, no. like that? They're no, no, the, the, the well, Gentiles were ex-pagans. Ex-pagans, right. So, like, I guess, you know, based on this kind of weird position that uh, these Gentiles are in uh, by adopting these kind of Jewish aspects but not becoming Jews, how do you then categorize them, you know, historically? Does that make sense? How, how am I thinking that Paul's thinking about them? Yeah, or how I am I, so. as a 21st century historian, thinking about them? Both. Okay, I can do that. Um, 
Thank you. You've just handled radioactive material when it comes to questions that um, people like me um, give papers about. Um, to use a contemporary term, a, an ancient term that's used in a lot of different contexts, what Paul is doing is Judaizing. There are these ethnic verbs. If you, if you act like um, a member of a different ethnic group, you have the ethnic, it's like saying to Irish eyes or to Italian eyes. You can Hellenize, and that means acting like a Greek. You can Persianize and act like a per who What is a Persian actually? You know, the, the whole idea of ethnic essentialism is how the system works. But for to get a, a, a non-Jew to act like a Jew is Judaizing them. And what Paul is doing is a radical form of Judaizing. What the pagans who were going to the synagogue and maybe showing up at Rosh Hashanah services, or you know, well into the fourth century, um, are doing is sort of doing some Jewish stuff, but not making a, a unique commitment to the Jewish God. Now we have in First Corinthians Paul yelling at some of his congregation in chapter five. Uh, somebody missed the memo, had already been baptized, and then went and sacrificed in front of one of his own gods, and Paul doesn't like that. Uh, somebody else started dating his own stepmother drives Paul crazy. So he's saying you can, you know, and, he, and he's talking to Gentiles and he's saying you're doing stuff that even the Gentiles don't do, but they are Gentiles. So there is no term. And it's exactly that point that you've just put your finger on. They are a social anomaly. This is a movement that doesn't expect to last out its own generation. Paul hardly talks about children at all. He's not thinking in a two generational model. And, and the very anomaly, the social anomaly that you're sensing, and my desperation, both the word pagan and the word Gentile translate a single Greek word, ta ethne. There's only one word for it. So this is really, it's, this, is, this is like watching, if I were an astronomer, seeing a galaxy be born, right? It's, this is how you can sense the newness and strangeness of this new movement. Eventually, by the early second century, these people will be called Christians, but that's a category that in Paul's lifetime doesn't exist. Terrific questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your lecture. Um, you've absolutely convinced me that monotheism is not a good term to you. <laughs> I particularly Great. liked your last quote, which you said, you know, monotheism. I think you said clouds more than clarifies when talking about occludes. It. Yeah. Occludes. Okay, I'll change that. Clouds would be better. <laughs> clouds is more poetic. <laughs> I like that better. With the same letters. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I would just wanted to ask what your favorite term would be then when it when it comes to antiquity, specifically Paul. Would it be megatheism? Yep. That would be your favorite? My God His God's bigger, bigger than all the other gods, definitely. And Paul uses the, the vocabulary of lesser deities when he right. talks about, he says, if you sacrifice to idols, you're, sac you're offering to daimonia. Um, so he, he's, using, he's using words for divinities, but the words themselves are located. That's why I asked you to envision a cosmic map. That he's not just gesturing toward beings. These beings are located within the cosmos, and his God is above all of them. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Speaking of trying to understand how other published theologians feel when you pull the rug out from under their feet <laughs> this way, um, it occurs to me that there was only a limited vocabulary. And if Paul needed, if we needed to preserve our concept of Numa as being Jesus' div unique divinity, um, the way Richard Hayes talks about the embodiment of the divine in Jesus, mm -hmm. um, that if Paul used the term Numa, maybe it was because no other word yet existed but he doesn't mean exactly the same thing. Is that a possibility? Um, 
I'll tell you why I think it's not. Um, and that's because um, when Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15, the transformation of the body of flesh and blood, the, you don't, in, in most ancient Mediterranean um, schools of thought that think about these things, flesh gets left in the realm below the moon where it belongs and spirit pneuma goes up. What Paul is talking about is the transformation of this into pneuma. And what he's talking about is everybody's body becoming a star body. And, because, and he's thinking of Genesis 15. Look up to the star, when, when God's talking with Abraham, look up to the sky and see if you can number the stars. That's what your descendants will be like. And Paul is reading that very seriously with his first century mindset. So I really do think he thinks the star bodies will be, and they're, they're going to be someplace in heaven. I am completely wrung out. So thank and you. And I think that it's absolutely, uh, we want to very much, thank you, Paula. Uh, you're a true, what should I say, a star, a rock star, <laughs> uh, a mega scholar, <laughs> should we say, uh, for sh really, I think, blowing our minds in a lot of ways today and opening up all sorts of important new categories that we'll be thinking about and stewing over for quite a while. I do invite you all to add some physical nutrition for your bodies as well as what we've had for our souls. There is some food in the back. You're free to, to sit and mingle and talk and raise more questions, uh, and at least until the food is gone. And uh, I just want to say I'm so happy that you were all in the room. It's so wonderful to be to giving a lecture to a room full of humans. And someday, so thank you for coming. Yeah, someday we will be just taking it for granted again. But for right now, absolutely not. Thank you for being our first thank you. live in the flesh lecturer also. <laughs> thank you.